Dave Friedenthal was the last Democrat to be elected governor of Wyoming, serving two terms in this century. Now he's added author to his list of life achievements. We'll talk to Governor Dave Friedenthal. I'm Steve Peck of Wyoming PBS. This is Wyoming Chronicle. Funding for this program is made possible in part by the Wyoming Humanities Council, helping Wyoming take a closer look at life through the humanities, thinkwhy.org, and by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support. I'm Steve Peck of Wyoming PBS. Welcome to Wyoming Chronicle. I'm very pleased today to be joined by the former two-term governor of Wyoming, Dave Friedenthal, Governor. Thanks for being with us, uh, happy to have you here. Thank you for including me. You are the author of a new book, Wyoming, The Paradox of Plenty, The Allure and Risk of a Mineral Economy. Mm -hmm. You've had a lot of things in your life. You were U.S. attorney, worked in the uh, governor's administration, uh, two-term governor, an attorney in private practice, uh, now an author. So three horn <laughs> question, why a book, why now, why this topic? As I say in the book, it really started uh, during one of those pandemic discussions, you know, inside your pod, where a, f a friend of mine, Butch, a businessman here in town, got to talking about how did we get to be so dependent on minerals? And I, of course, uh, said, well, it was the severance tax in 1969. And then, um, as most people had, we had a lot of time to think during uh, uh, COVID. Sure did. And I thought, you know, that's, that's a pretty flip answer. So I thought, I'm going to figure this out. You've never written a book before, is that right? That's correct. Uh, I, I, for one, hope you might have your anecdotal memoir in you <laughs> at some point still, but that's for you to decide. Yeah, a lot was, of stories are best left untold. <laughs> okay. What was your writing process like? How did you go about it? You know, um, you know lawyers, we write a lot. Yeah. But this is a different kind. Mm -hmm. um, what I had a lot of fun with was the research tracking down the data, and just started beginning to understand how we commenced in 1900 to destroy the basic founding father's premise about how we would be governed. Um, the hard part then was to decide, yeah, I think I'll write this up. Uh, so then you do that. Then you send it off to a publisher, and I chose to uh, uh, self-publish with a group in Wyoming because I wanted to do it in Wyoming. And uh, uh, then the editor starts saying, so what's your source for that? And I'd say, well, well it's governor. I, I can, no, no, no. So that's why there's so many footnotes and stuff. Yeah. It was um, uh, because of COVID, you know, we weren't going out a lot. So you had your weekends, you had your evening. I, I was still practicing law, but it wasn't as busy. And so um, you had time to do the research and to, uh, to ruminate and to think great thoughts. On the other hand, not so many great thoughts. But the point is, it's a lot of work, but at the end of the day, I'm glad I did it. And you didn't necessarily say, today I'm writing 500 words or no. two hours or, no. it was as, as you were able to, as you felt the, mm -hmm. you were moved by the mood. Mm -hmm. Type, you write this way, do you dictate? No, I you, type. You type. You know, as I was doing that, I wish I was far better with merge and purge and insert and all of that stuff. But yeah, I, I, um, I compose um, at, at the, Computer. Lawyerly paragraphs you mentioned at some point that your editor helped, mm -hmm. helped, you, uh, helped you with. Yeah, she's a wonderful woman, but not always kind. And I uh, spent a lot of time um, researching, talking to people, and I discovered that I was wrong. It wasn't 1969. It was probably about 1900. So when people say, well, we need to quit being this commodity economy and get back to the way it was before, it really was always this way. Always a, com a commodity economy. I mean, it was agriculture and coal um, early on. Uh, then it evolved to oil, and then you had uh, uh, bentonite, uranium, some others, uh, the iron mine up in uh, Lander, and, uh, and then you had the coal boom. And the coal was really interesting because it was a real mainstay for the economy until the railroad shifted in 1947 from coal to diesel. And then it tanked. And then um, come uh, uh, you know, the late uh, 60s and into the 70s, um, and particularly in the mid-70s with the Arab oil embargo, uh, the reemphasis on 
domestic energy sources, and coal was a logical one. Then the Clean Air Act comes along, and thanks to Al Simpson, we ended up with language that said you uh, could meet the SO2 standards by switching to low sulfur coal. Mm -hmm. And at that stage, That's Gillette took thought. off. Yeah. Took and interestingly off. enough, uh, rail became hugely important again at that point. Absolutely, absolutely. Not, not because we were fueling the rail, but because the rail was hauling our product. Yes. You said in your high school graduation year, which was 1969. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, okay, good. You said it. I didn't have to. That was the year that the severance tax was passed. Yes. Severance tax is a term, I think, in Wyoming that many people have heard. But I don't know how many people could actually define it. What is it? Severance tax is a tax on the privilege of severing a mineral from, the, from its ground estate. And the reason that happens that way, uh, particularly in a place like Wyoming, where so many of the minerals are federal, you can't tax federal property. So you can't tax federal minerals. So you attach a privilege to a, the, for separating the mineral because once it's separated, it becomes personal property and it's subject to tax. Hence the word severance. And they, uh, the producers probably didn't love that idea. And still it's talked about often. But for the privilege, and in this case, as what you've described earlier explains, illustrates, as the 60s ended, the 70s began, the great privilege, as it turned out, of mining Wyoming coal was something they could live with. How would you describe it as an idea at the time from what you learned in researching well, the book? Well, it turns out that it was actually discussed in the original Constitutional Convention um, as a uh, special tax on coal. And it was debated back and forth. Uh, and it related to the same problem, which you know, is that nobody could figure out how do you value coal lands for purpose of property tax. Uh, it uh, was not adopted. Instead, they adopted language that allowed the future legislators to tax minerals as they deemed appropriate. So then you go through and you, you hit the 20s, and I think uh, that would have been Governor Ross and his, his group. They, uh, they had a constitutional amendment to impose a severance tax. Um, the amendment failed even though it received more, more yes votes than no votes in the election. Because in Wyoming. Because in Wyoming, uh, a non-vote counts as a no vote. And so there were some other attempts later on through legislation and stuff, but it was 66, uh, the election of Hathaway, where the contest was really joined about, uh, do we need a severance tax? Now this is Governor Stan Hathaway you're talking about, mm -hmm. two-term Republican elected in the mid-60s. Mm -hmm. Republican. Mm -hmm. This is the severance tax is, has the word tax in it. It's a big tax proposal. Mm -hmm. What did he see? What did elected leaders at the time see at the time that made them think that this had to be done? Ought to be well, done? the irony of it is, is that the tax issue was brought up by his his Democratic opponent in '66, and Hathaway just blasted it. And then he had something called the Industrial Committee that ran ads against it, and so. He was elected on an anti-severance tax platform in 1966. In 1969, and all that, I need back up because it's even more ironic. His opponent proposed uh, a 3% severance tax, 1.5% in a permanent fund, 1.5% for operating. 69, Hathaway did the severance tax. But you know, um, first of all, you can dispense with the mythology that the state was broke in 69. I mean, he, I've, I've, I've known Stan or knew Stan a long time, and he'd talk about that, and I'd say, oh, that wasn't true, because the data doesn't support that. What really happened was he'd increased taxes on a variety of things in 67. In 69, he had a clear sense that energy was going to be a big deal, that we needed to sort of get on it. And uh, uh, so he had things he wanted to do. He had, a, he had what uh, Larson called a very progressive vision of Wyoming. Now, and forgive me again, Larson being T.A. Larson, Larson, yeah, Larson who wrote the T.A. Larson still considered the Wyoming. definitive history of Wyoming. Yes. Absolutely, but the wonderful thing is that uh, he decided, look, let's do a severance tax. He had campaigned against the severance tax, so he didn't call it that. He called it a products tax or something like that. But it was in effect a severance tax, and then you that in '69 generated considerable revenue. Um, leap forward to uh, 74, then he, um, they adopted, the legislature adopted a permanent mineral trust fund. And Stan and Governor Hathaway had been against that all along. 
Um, and then suddenly, the headline in the Casper Star the day he gave his speech was that Stan uh, drops a bomb because he flipped his position and supported it. The backstory of that is that there were enough um, Republicans who wanted it, legislators, as well as Democrats who wanted it, that it was going to pass. Now, I don't know if it would, have pa it would have survived had he vetoed it, but he ended up at the end of his eight years having put in place exactly what he ran against his opponent in 1966. History is so wonderful in terms of the irony. Yeah, and interesting how, uh, I don't know if he took a lot of guff for that politically at the time or not. Now, of course, the idea that you might actually change your position often is attacked, that you're sold out, you flip-flopped. But on the other hand, supposedly the reason you're attacking someone's position is because you want him to come on over to yours. Do you think he or the lawmakers in the late 60s had any idea what was going to happen with Wyoming Minerals in terms of the revenue that this tax procedure and this permanent trust fund would amount to? Well, in his, in his talk, uh, Governor Hathaway said he hoped that by uh, the end of that century it had $2 billion in it. But they did have a sense of what was transpiring. Um, there was a report called Cameron Engineers that came out uh, that was funded by the old uh, Natural Resources Board. And it laid out this remarkable future, particularly built around coal, um, because the notion was that um, you would have 10 uh, 1,000 megawatt power plants along with a bunch of coal gasification and coal liquefaction plants in Gillette. And uh, uh, it, was, um, it was clear that the mineral storehouse that our forefathers talked about in the Constitutional Convention was real and markets were finally moving in our way. And what I think they really get credit for is a kind of adult behavior that said, look, we know where markets are going. We know that Wyoming has something to offer and we're going to uh, use that shift in the markets to build this state. And I think they get credit for that. And we'll talk later about some um, criticisms, I think it's safe to say, you have from how that's developed over time. Mm -hmm. But certainly at the beginning, there's a lot to be said for what they did. It was innovative, it was showed mm -hmm. foresight, and certainly it was lucrative. And it was accomplishing the things that they wanted to accomplish at the time. Yeah, and, and where it got off the rails was once we had the money, we did away with the traditional property tax or, and the traditional tax base. Because you have to remember, Wyoming was formulated on the idea that uh, it would be property tax, uh, both on, on uh, uh, personal and real property that would support all levels of government. And interestingly enough, it also envisioned that counties would be more powerful than the state. And the two things that happened post severance tax was, um, they started taking everything off the tax rolls. I mean, uh, between Hathaway and Herschler, and, uh, and they're both dear, wonderful people, um, they knew that people didn't want to pay taxes. And so they made sure they didn't. And it was all offloaded onto the minerals because what happened was starting in 1900, we just eroded the tax base, but we could really accelerate it after the severance tax. And the only thing that was valued at 100% um, was minerals and houses and stuff were, were down around 18%, 20%. So the tax burden shifted. Yeah. And now there's been a generation or two that's really never known any other way. Yeah, I mean, and the, 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 you know, the taxpayer's data shows pretty clearly that as individuals, we pay about 20% of the cost of all the services we receive. The rest of the remainder of it is made up with federal money, uh, mineral taxes, current mineral taxes, as well as the revenue from the Permanent Mineral Trust Fund, which is really mineral revenue just invested. But the only reason they can have a, uh, we're never gonna tax policy, is that we're still living off of that old revenue. I've likened it sometimes to a, uh, I don't know, maybe a big chunk of ice that you have in your house and you're leaning against it to get cool and you're chipping it off to keep your drink cool. Mm -hmm. But a lot of things can happen over time, you've tipped off too much, or it starts to melt, it's just not as big as it was, or there's more people that are using it, and a lot of things can happen with these, the commodities economy, and we can all think of it. there's markets, there's uh, depletion, there's management, there's 
shifting political winds, there's more demand. And the other risk, am I right in thinking that this soul or such heavy reliance on it also tends to make us complacent, maybe a bit less ambitious, maybe a bit less uh, expansive in our viewpoint of things, so that even when maybe the recognition is, is that the time has come to do something different, that is it inertia that it makes it harder to, to do. It, it is, and it because we become comfortable. And as markets shift, then it's shifting, um, obviously, uh, it, it's harder for Wyoming now because they're better, uh, fracking created an entirely different landscape for oil and gas development. Uh, the age of coal plants and the emergence of natural gas has made an entirely different landscape for coal. And so what we didn't do um, uh, historically is use any of the revenue that was excess revenue from the minerals to begin to build other kinds of economies. Uh, I mean, if you look at um, the states that surround us, um, they invested heavily in their educational institutions and in innovation, their universities and stuff. And, um, uh, and those, those have become centers for their economy. Here, um, we didn't feel the drive to uh, support alternative economies uh, because the, the, it, doing that was somehow viewed as a threat. I remember when I came in and I wanted to resurrect the tourism, which was uh, uh, really advanced by uh, Hanson and Hathaway, that there was a lot of pushback saying, look, tourist jobs don't pay enough. We don't want that. Uh, I mean, we got it done anyway. But the, the problem is that we haven't invested the money. We're proud of how much we save. And we say that you're doing that for future generations. No, we're doing that for ourselves so that you and I don't have to pay taxes. Um, if, you, if you want to do something for future generations, we ought to be investing that money in some form of alternative economy so that the future generations have a job that keeps them in Wyoming. This is something that you talk about forcefully, write about forcefully in the book. I mean, people could say, what do you mean we aren't investing? We've, if it were my household and I invested in a 401k or a CD that got this great level of return, well, I'd be proud of myself. The business might feel the same way. And people love to say, it's very easy to say, well, think of it in terms of your own household or the government's a business. That's all it is. We ought to run it like a business. But there's a, there's a big difference there. I, the, the state doesn't retire one day mm -hmm. and the state can't sell or go out of business. Uh, and so you're talking about an investment that involves investing in people, not just a bank accounts. Right. And you know, it, it, it um uh, we're pretty good at investing in education. Uh, we, we, we were able to get the Hathaway Scholarship because I, I believed in that because it's important that we get people educated. I want them to have a good life. I prefer it be in Wyoming, but most of all, you want your children to have a good life. And we built dozens of schools in a we short period of time. A slew of schools. Yeah. We enhanced the community college infrastructure, right. university infrastructure. What I would say, the reason I don't like that comparison to the household budget is we're gonna die. The state doesn't die, and its population continues. And when we are so focused on, I don't want to have to pay taxes, but I want a lot of services, as opposed to maybe we need to figure out a way to bear part of that burden ourselves, use some of that excess money that would build an economy that would allow our children and grandchildren the choice to stay here. We've got yeah. children. Where yeah. are they now? Uh, Greece, Kansas City, Seattle, and one is here at least two of them, two more of them would be here if they could have a career. I mean, they love the place, they love the outdoors, and we'd love to have them here because we've got grandkids. But to me, the, the, the failing, and you see it now, I mean, the, the legislature is bragging about how much money they saved. And I think when they say, well, we're saving it for future generations, maybe what we ought to be doing is figuring out how to make sure future generations can be employed. A job is a really good thing to have. It is. My um, grandparents, born around the turn of the century, had six children. Three of them lived in Wyoming as adults, and only two of them long term. And they had among them ten children. Of the ten, the cousins, as I call us, three of us live in Wyoming, and the youngest of us is 60 years old. Among the cousins, there were ten more children, zero. 
living in Wyoming. And these are people that Wyoming could use. My son, my, my cousin's children, smart people, thinking people, idea people, contributing people, educated people, people with skills, they're just not here. And that's, a, so of course it means, you know, my family is kaput now in Wyoming, essentially right. after one more right. generation, see that's the way it looks. So that's a sobering thought for, for, for individuals, but of course if you apply it to tens of thousands of families around the state, it becomes something that you, I mean, we all have heard about the brain drain. You talk a lot about that in this book. You think it's a calamity. I, I do. I mean, Wyoming creates incredibly bright people, but there's nothing for them to do here to exercise that intellect or even, and I don't mean just that, I mean just to be really good welders. The, the issue is sort of illustrated by the numbers that came out this year. This is the first year in 100 years that we had um, more deaths than births in Wyoming. And that tells you that we are, in fact, the fifth or sixth fastest aging state. And we continue to, in a relative sense, decline in population. And, um, uh, and, it, and it's not something that's new. I mean, in the, in the 90s, um, Broder did a column about Wyoming in which he referred to us he was quoting people at a Wyoming conference that Wyoming was the donut hole in, prosper, in the prosperity of the Rockies. Again, I, I know who you're talking about. This is David Broder, longtime yeah. columnist with the yeah. Washington Post. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he was noticing Wyoming from across the country. Right. Yeah. And the thing that, that is interesting is, is, that, is that we end up saying, well, um, we don't want growth. We don't want things to change. We want to be who we are. We can have these values and still have a prosperous state that makes room for children or young adults uh, to stay and, and to have a job or, or to move in. Uh, states are like businesses. You know, if you're not going up, you're probably going down, certainly in a relative sense. I mean, the only thing that bailed us out uh, of having to make these hard decisions was the COVID aid. I mean, $14 billion in a state whose gross state product is $37 billion. It's a lot of money. Because we got some influx from people leaving other states to move to Wyoming during the pandemic, the population itself might have held its own into just a gross number. That's not exactly a great way to plan, though, is it? Let's have another global pandemic so no, we can make... I prefer not. Yeah, and, uh, and, but it, it also could be the kind of thing that, again, uh, maintains the complacency for just a bit longer. That and the... And the um, uh, the funding that came with COVID, sure. the spike in energy prices that came with the end of COVID and the war in Europe. Um, but if you look at the data, uh, largely it is uh, older people who are moving in. And they're moving in, uh, they're making a killing, selling their property somewhere else, they're, buy, they're downsizing, uh, buying a lot of house, and um, a lot of them aren't even in the workforce. And I mean, they will this, need services. Yeah, I mean, this is a great place to preserve wealth. I mean, you get great services, um, no taxes, and there's lots of space. Here's a, a hypothesis or, for you. We would have been better off if the minerals hadn't boomed as quickly and as much as they did when the severance tax and the permanent trust fund were first established. Because then we wouldn't have seen, wouldn't have been like winning the lottery. It would have been more like a, uh, just a steady investment that we might make in a 401k or something. And this, this sense of, my gosh, we've hit the jackpot where we've got it made might not have uh, taken hold. Yeah, I'm, yes, not no, sure, maybe. I'm not sure I agree with that. I okay. mean, admittedly, it was an incredible boom. I mean, in that 10 year period, the population in that sort of the 70s to 80s in that time period, a little bit in the 60s, population grew more in that decade than it grew in the next four subsequent decades. Wow. Um, right up to 2020. Um, I think that it was more the, the, um, the decision to, to not retain that sort of cowboy notion that we're going to pay for part of our own. We're going to be part of the solution. And so, yeah, there was a lot of money and, and we did an incredible amount of tax relief. I mean, we got rid of the tax on cattle, we got rid of inventory tax, we got rid of, and, and uh, so you end up, um, the decision not to use part of that to begin to understand that 
markets change and demand changes. And what was interesting to me in reading and going back all the way to the uh, Constitutional Day was that, was that people knew it. They knew that um, we're subject to markets and that commodities are commodities. And yet when we had, uh, um, it, it, it sort of didn't, didn't stick that, you know, it's like if a business has a really great year, it usually goes out and says, all right, we need new equipment. We need to be, maybe we ought to look at some new lines or we need to get some new intellectual property. But instead we said, I think we're just gonna cut all of our taxes. And that's what we did. Funding for this program is made possible in part by the Wyoming Humanities Council, helping Wyoming take a closer look at life through the humanities, thinkwhy.org, and by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support.